five, four, three, two, one. Good afternoon. This is Dr. John Bennett, broadcasting from Miami. Today we have another in the series of the neurosurgical channel of Larkin Hospital TV. Uh, we once again have Dr. Richard Mandel, the spinal neurosurgeon, Richard Mandel, MD, the spinal neurosurgeon from uh, Tampa and Clearwater. He's going to be talking about normal uh, pressures, hydrocephalus today. And we have a couple of distinguished panelists. First, we'll start with Shajish. How are you doing, Shajish? Hello. Hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sajish Kriakos. Um, I'm a, a head and neck maxillofacial surgeon, and uh, I teach in Larkin Health Science Institute. I teach neuroanatomy, neuroscience, and neurophysiology, and I'm really thankful for uh, being on the panel today, and uh, thank you very much, John. You're welcome. Sajish, and Sajish may be doing some... Uh, head and neck surgery uh, hangout soon. Uh, welcome, Mohammed. Hello, everyone. My name is Mohammed Saleh, and I'm joining today from Windsor, Ontario. Glad to be with you today. Welcome, Mohammed. Okay, Richard, it's all yours. Well, you know, today I thought we would just do, you know, because it's, you know, a holiday weekend, we'll just do a short presentation on what what a lot of people refer to as normal pressure hydrocephalus and that got first described by Victor Adams the neurologist in in the 60s I think it was like 65 and you know lots of, um, of um, medical students know normal pressure hydrocephalus like they'll learn it in their first clinical years as wet uh, wet, wobbly, and weak, or th they'll use something like that where where it's a triad of um, urinary incontinence, a degree of confusion, and um, a, a gate that's sometimes called a magnetic gate where, where the um, patient actually walks as though they're stuck to the floor. And, um, and to this day, there's really not a a, a real consensus or or um, algorithm or protocol for how to met, um, how to treat normal pressure hydrocephalus. But there is kind of a consensus about um, uh, um, in different areas, and I, and I really think it's because when we talk about normal pressure hydrocephalus, it's not really clearly defined and and I think that we're not dealing with one disease entity. We're probably, we probably don't know as much as we need to. And I think over the next many years, we're going to get better at predicting things. The problem with normal pressure hydrocephalus is that you're dealing with one of the dementias. But it's, it, it's a small portion of dementias. In people that are 70 to 79 years old, I think only a very small percentage, like 0.2 percent of all dementias are from, quote, normal pressure hydrocephalus. But as soon as you hit 80 years of age, it goes up to like 5.5 percent. And this, the, this data really just came from a recent review by Luke Jasmine. And um, he, he mentioned several, several things that, that I thought were worth repeating uh, because normal pressure hydrocephalus probably is um, probably a lot of it has to do with a um, change in the compliance of the brain itself because when when people talk about normal pressure hydrocephalus they talk about very enlarged ventricles but the sulci really aren't effaced anywhere near as much as you, you'd think they would be. And so perhaps the brain is just uh, um, getting more, less compliant or, or um, an issue such as that, like maybe so, something's going on, like there's axonal degeneration. We don't really know. The things that you do know though are that normal pressure hydrocephalus the subtle subtle um, 
higher function changes often go on for many years um, before it becomes somewhat prominent and the gait and the urinary incontinence, urinary incontinence appear. So this is something like that can go on for you know a long time and be cl not be clinically evident until the urinary problems start. And the urinary problems start just as you, you'd imagine. It's not sudden incontinence. It's a dribbling. The dribbling gets worse. Then it's uh, um, urinary urgency. Then floor wetting themselves. And one of the things that Dr. Jasmine mentioned is that fecal incontinence is really, really rare. Really rare. So if, if you've got a patient with fecal incontinence, it's probably not NPH. The other thing is the more the neurologic changes represent a cortical problem like an agnosia, an aphasia, a, a paresis, the less likely it's going to be um, normal pressure hydrocephalus. NPH is kind of a you know a subcortical dementia and so my, my thinking on this is that right now there's two two kinds of normal pressure hydrocephalus one is the primary or you know, what we always call idiopathic NPH, and then secondary NPH. There's no cause of idiopathic NPH, but secondary NPH can be um, secondary to a problem such as a subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, meningitis, and infectious etiology. Several different things can trigger the, the quote, secondary NPH. Um, so is that a good characterization of NPH? I don't really think so. Uh, I think it's just kind of a going to turn out to be several um, several other diseases that are that creep into the the dementia diagnosis. So um, NPH gets treated differently in a lot of places. I think in the US the consensus is that to work somebody up you want to sample the spinal fluid first. Um, I mean once you've ruled out you know all the other standard causes of, of uh, dementias but when, when you suspect it's NPH you really want to do a lumbar puncture and you want to do something that we don't I'm sorry, that we don't put as much value in as, as older neurosurgeons did, and that is you really do want to measure the pressures, the opening pressures, and uh, that, that's an important part of NPH because once you see an opening pressure higher than 20, that's not normal pressure anymore. That, that's, that's a more standard hydros, hydrocephalus. And um, so you have to um, you have to remember that you want to tap a patient in a position where you can get a reliable measurement. You know, m most of the, most of the people used to do an LP tap with patients lying on their side, and you would measure zero to zero. A lot of times, in these patients have had lots of surgery, and I'll do them sitting up, and I just use a Longer, tu longer tubing to to equilibrate it. So I measure zero as at the um, external external auditory meatus. I, I consider that zero. So, um, but you want to know that the the pressure that you're getting is falling within quote normal pressure, which is 20 or less. And Dr. Jasmine. Um, you know, gives a lot, a lot of good references in a recent uh, uh, review article, but um, he he really felt that the people that were above uh, 14 um, centimeters of, or centimeters of water or millimeters of mercury, you know, th at that level, they're almost the same, do much much better with shunning. Um, 
And there's a recent textbook that came out about the complications of shunning. Uh, shunning it is often a, a really good device, a, a, a um, um, ventricular or perineal shunt with an anti-gravity device in it, like an anti-siphon device, is really great. But it's not without complications. And the complication rate that Dr. Jasmine's, Jasmine cited oh, and, and laughed about it was that it's 29 to about 96%. And a lot of it is because you may be putting a shunt in somebody who's already got a more advanced dementia. And, you know, the truth of the matter is, you know, once somebody reaches a significant dementia, the lifespan is about seven years after that, it, it, pretty much at most. And so, you know, if you're not catching this early, your results aren't going to seem very good. And I think over time we're going to have to f get a better handle on what the real real changes are in the brain's compliance because, I, I, you know, it's hard to imagine why, why it's at a low pressure these issues are, are developing unless there's something going on physiologically. I mean, anatomically we don't really it, it's very um, hard to say. There's different indices that are used, like the Evans indices and the measurements about the size of the fourth ventricle. And the, there's a lot of um, a lot of discussion that the you know a lot of people believe the fourth ventricle has to be dilated. It doesn't have to be dilated in normal pressure hydrocephalus. Um, so I think that with when you're working up NPH, the first thing you want to do is get a good measure of an LP, and you want to do a high enough volume tap, 10, 15, maybe even 20 cc's the first time to see if there's any improvement. A higher volume tap's okay. You just don't... The problem with over-draining somebody or with putting a lumbopartneal shunt in is that if you over-drain them, their risk for... Um, a subdural hematoma or larger hygroma is forming on the on the surface of the brain, and then you've converted you know a, a hydrocephalus large ventricles to smaller ventricles, but because they're being pushed by large fluid collections um, from the periphery. So NPH still isn't a really well. Uh, um, it's still a little bit of an, amorph uh, an amorphous thing. It takes a lot of judgment to um, determine who's best suited for a, a, a lumbopartneal, uh, I mean a uh, ventriculopartneal shunt. In other countries, like in, in Japan especially, the idea of neurosurgery doesn't sit well with a lot of people, and so a lumboperitoneal shunt often gets inserted. Lumboperitoneal shunts, I don't really like very much because I, I don't know when they're working. It's hard to tell when they're working if there's a clinical change in the patient. And the other problem with with any kind of shunting, lumboperitoneal, ventriculoperitoneal, in an obese patient, a lot of times if you do a ventriculoperitoneal shunt, an, an obese patient, which you know is not rare in America, they can have an intra-abdominal pressure so high that the shunt doesn't function well. And if they're obese, you know you don't know that the lumbopartneal shunt's working well either. And other pharmacologic treatments, which have been a long, long, long time, like acetylazolamide, it, it doesn't really re yield a very satisfactory outcome. In the past, and I, I really, to be honest with you, I don't shunt people that much anymore because my practice is more spine-based. And um, shunting is seems like a simple procedure, but it is not. It, it, I mean, it, it, it's a difficult. It's difficult to place a, a shunt without revisions and uh, quite a bit of uh, of um, frustration. So 
I, I'm hoping that in, in the next few years with better technologies, we'll get an I idea that normal pressure hydrocephalus isn't one entity. It's probably a lot of other things going on that we really don't have such a great handle on yet. That's really about it. Uh, Richard, thank you very much for an uh, excellent presentation. Now, um, is it how do patients get to you? Are they already diagnosed with it, or they say, uh, "Well, Dr. Mandel, we have a patient with dementia. We can't figure out why." Yeah, well, you know, a lot of times, what happens is the um, the patient will have gotten an MRI, and um, you know, maybe a neuroradiologist says possible dementia. I'm sorry, possible normal pressure hydrocephalus, and 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 a lot of times, if the MRI is gotten for a good reason, that's great. But if the MRI is not gotten for a great reason, you have a patient that seems to be doing well with you know ventricles that are questionable. Oftentimes, the best thing to do there is observe them, um, but yeah, a lot of times patients are referred to you because of a an incidental finding on an MRI and, uh, or a CAT scan. Um, the best referral for NPH is going to be when a neurologist has already worked them up and says, "Look, what do you, what do you think?" And it's very good, especially if you're someone like me who does mostly spine now in private practice, it's good to work with a neurologist so that you're convinced that there really is a, a change in the patient when you do the lumbar puncture. Because, you know, a, another option, and I did this a lot, was I would do the first puncture, see how the patient did, and then I might admit them for a few days and just do a lumbar drainage for several days, like do a lumbar puncture and place a drain and drain them slowly for several days to see if they got better because unfortunately a lot of times, you know, the family really wants the patient to get better so that you place the shunt and in the hopes that they are getting better and they're not, the patient's family is not lying to you, they really, they so much want the patient to be better that they can take very subtle findings and think, oh, oh, they're much better, and you, you really want to be able to rely on, on someone like a neurologist who can say, you know, I really think they're better, or I'm not sure they're better, and, and they can do like a, um, something more than a mini mental status exam to uh, really determine the patient is better. And you can imagine in the days of managed care and everything else, nobody wants you to admit a, a patient for three or four days of lumbar spinal drainage to discern whether or not they're demented. Uh, it, it, it's very hard to get to get people worked up well. Mm -hmm. Sajish and Mohammed, do you have questions? Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Mandel, for the great presentation. I have one question regarding the shunts they use. I know, like I read, they use the lumbar shunts, the ventricular, and there is a one that the right atrium shunt. Can we know, like, a little bit more about this type of shunt? Like, is it how often is it used? Yeah, this is that's a great question, and it's really a topic uh, unto itself. But but it's a great question. In in the late fifties, I think there was a, an engineer named named uh, Halter, H-O-L-T-E-R, and he had a child born with hydrocephalus, and the consulting neurosurgeon really wasn't really, couldn't really treat the kid, and Halter developed a valve that became named the Spitz-Halter valve after the neurosurgeon Spitz. Of course, his name went first, but you know, Halter thought of everything. And Halter and Spitz became very famous for placing a valve. And that first valve was a uh, from the ventricle to the right atrium. And um, for years, uh, that was a standard. But, uh, but what, what's happened in the U.S. is that we tend to drain babies more to their peritoneal space. Um, 
now rather than going into the atrium. Um, going into the atrium got a renaissance though a while ago, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But the lumboperitoneal shunt doesn't go into the brain, it goes into the lumbar spine, and then you tunnel it around the person's flank into their belly, and you put, you know, it goes into the peritoneum by tunneling it around the retroperitoneum. The problem with anything going into the retroperitoneum is in a patient that has disease or has had bad um, peritoneal infections before or, or a lot of surgery or scarring, the peritoneal area, peritoneum won't drain as well as it should. Um, also, um, um, there were some issues with um, um, nephritis, I think. Um, but in babies, the peritoneal space w w was a good, good place to put the, um, the tip of the catheter. Later on, um, several years, this is probably 20 years ago, this bright, really bright Egyptian neurosurgeon had a new technique because he had so, such limited resources in Egypt and he was treating all these Alex. So what he was doing was he was putting the routine uh, ventricular shunt in, but he didn't have valves. The valves is the most expensive part of the apparatus. So he would just take this tube, place it into the brain, and then he would place it into the uh, vena cava, uh, yeah, vena cava against the flow. And because it was against the flow, there was enough turbulence that it kept the tubing open, and it can, and it worked. It worked worked well, and it was much less expensive. And I I think that that did well in the U.S. Of course, we still use valves and anti-siphoning device. So when the child goes from a recumbent to a erect posture, there's not a, a a change in the amount that drains, but you know um, the history of shunts is real is really um, quite complicated. A lot of people have tried a lot of different things. Um, the, um, there are no studies, no studies, Richard, that say shunting is uh, the best thing to do. I think overall the consensus these days is that uh, um, for NPH you want to do. A, I think a ventricular peritoneal shunt in this country is still the standard. And that's what Dr. Jasmine finds in the neurosurgery practical reviews last month, the August 15th edition. That, that's what he espoused. And, um, um, you know, people will talk about shunts as though they're low risk, they're a common everyday thing. Neurosurgeons could, who are good can put a shunt in in minutes. But that doesn't mean it's easy, and it doesn't mean it's without risk. There are risks. There's infection risks, and in a, you, I think you're, you're, most of the time better off going to someone. Uh, you know, the pediatric neurosurgeons are great at it. Lots of adult neurosurgeons put them in, but you want somebody that does a high volume of them, um, uh, because the, there's a lot of a lot of things that can go wrong, and those patients have to be followed closely to make sure. I mean, even if they're drained at a little bit too high a pressure, you may see hygromas, you know, fluid collections on the outside of the, on the cortex develop, but it may take months. So you want to be very scrupulous with, with, with the shunning and the shunning follow-up. It's not just an easy, you know, people that, may not be as familiar with shunning, may, may talk about it as though it's just like a passe, easy thing. It is not. <laughs> it's, it's not at all. So. Mr. G, you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Richard, yeah, I just wanted to uh, uh, know whether, you know, the weepy shun, would you consider <laughs> the most uh, commonly used shun uh, to, in this day and age? Uh, in the in the U.S. and in in London in England, it is the VP shunt. 
when people talk about a shunt, they just almost leave off VP because shunt, that, that's what you do first. Oh, okay. But, um, you know, that, you know, if you've got a patient that's had renal, renal problems and has a scarred in peritoneum, you still may want to go to the atrium. There are other places you may want to go. Lots of good, um, lots of surgeons, neurosurgeons who got very good at endoscopy would do a balloon dilatation uh, uh, for uh, non-communicating hydrocephalus. That's another technique. I don't do that. I mean, it's not a it's not an exotic procedure, but it's not something that I think I'm still good at doing because I do it so infrequently. But lots of people do it. Yeah, um, and we used but, to come across a lot of these um, uh, hydrocephalus in the Middle East oh, uh, sure. while I was working there. And um, I had a good friend of mine, a neurosurgeon, who used to uh, swear by the weepy shunts. Um, he taught the the chance of the complications, which is mainly blockage, um, was an infection, yes. Uh, these two was quite low, but I'm talking about 20 years back. So we just yeah. want to know what's the current status. Well, somebody with a high volume like your friend is probably very good and the complication rate is very low. But I'm sure it still keeps them up at night worrying because he may have a thousand kids with shunts, and you're always worried about even if it's you know, even if your infection rate's small, you're always worried about shunt infections and shunt blockage. And you know, um, the one thing I learned, I, I mean, always listen to them. If a mother tells you the shunt's blocked, it's blocked. <laughs> if they tell you there's a shunt obstruction, that shunt's obstructed whether you think it is or not. So, um, yeah, in, in the Middle East where, you know, you just don't, you may not have, res you can have tremendous resources in one city, but out in the rural area you have no resources. The guys that are putting those in, uh, I'm sure, are very good and have a very low complication rate. Oh, I agree with you. Mother is the best uh, source, uh, especially yeah. uh, all over the world, but particularly in the Middle East because they are so, I mean, I don't know the language. So, you know, I, I just look at the mother and if I see her upset, I know something is wrong. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, and if you try to tell the mother that you've done a test and you know that it's not blocked, yeah. you'll be sorry because within 12 to 72 hours, you'll be apologizing to her, telling her, I should have listened. You were right. It may not be blocked. It may just be infected instead, which is even worse. Oh, but, yeah, yeah they, the, the mother knows when something's going on. Yeah, absolutely. Agree, agree. Thank you very much, Richard. Yeah, yeah. Richard, Richard one more question from a, uh, from a, a Twitterer. Is there a specific age group that uh, tends to see normal pressure hydrocephalus cases more than others? Yeah, like like I said, normal pressure hydrocephalus, the incidence isn't really very, very high. And if in in the 70 to 79-year-old age range, that's like 0.2%. I think Luke Jasmine said, yeah, 0.2% of all dementias. But the minute they turn 80, it becomes 5% of all dementias. Dementia is really common. So... 5% of dementias, NPH explodes at about that the beginning of that ninth decade. Um, so, you know, you know, I, I think really that we have all kinds of organs, and some organs are better in some ways than other organs. I don't know if the brain's meant to live nine or ten decades. I, I mean, I know people do well, but I, I think you know, when you get up there into that ninth decade and you see the change that goes from 0.2% to 5% to five percent of all dementias, I, I'm not sure we're tracking the ent entity right. I'm not sure we know maybe as much as we need to yet. Well, that'll yeah. be interesting. Well, okay, Richard, we'll keep it short and sweet since it is a holiday. 
we can uh, the college kids require today. Yeah, well, what um, yeah, what do you do? You have anything you want to talk about next time? I mean, uh, shunts aren't that's okay. Shunts uh, are fascinating, but you know, uh, they make my blood run cold actually. But um, you have to know how to, you have to know how to take care of a shunt. I mean, that's critical. Yeah, well, do, do, that that brings up another question. Are, are nurses have to be specially trained, or, or most nurses can figure it out? You know what? I, I'm a board certified neurosurgeon, and I can't. I still can't oh, really? figure it out. I have the time. Uh -huh. I mean, my junior. I had a junior resident one year behind me, and he was much better at figuring out shunts than I was. I would sit there. I, I, I mean, you you always have to rule out. Blockage and infection, uh, you, you know, uh, it's very, it's difficult. Very good. Okay, but, but I, I don't think you could depend. I mean, a nurse may have a good sense if she's a, a full-time pediatric neuro, neuro nurse. She'll have a pretty good sense of what's going on. But I think she, like a lot of people, we don't really know as much as we should. So she has a good instinct, but. Uh, I think you have to you have to prove it to yourself that that shunt is or is not working. And of course, you can do procedures like inject the shunt under under extra under extra under floor with dye and see that it's working. But remember, every time you touch a shunt, it doesn't need to be touched. Then the infection rate goes up. Right, right. So, so mostly it's a clinical intuition that it is. Yeah, because you have to try to figure out if the shunt is blocked between the catheter to the valve, whereas the valve isn't working, or if it's blocked distally going into the belly. And and so um, there, there are a few different ways to, to determine that. And Sajish would probably be interested, you know, where you place the catheter, because most guys, most people, I think, these days place them in the um, uh, right frontal area about here. But a lot of guys still will place them posteriorly through the, through the occiput. And, and there's subtleties about each one of them. So um, I, I think that's outside this. Uh, Very good. Very good, Richard. I, thank you for coming out today. And we'll, we'll talk, think about what we're going to do next week. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll think. Well, if somebody has something they want to talk about, we can. Or I'll okay. try to find something. Very good. Okay, Richard. Thank you very much. Have a good. Uh, now that now that you know it's a holiday, have a good holiday weekend. <laughs> all right, Sajis and Muhammad. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye.